Welcome to the Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb, and as always, we've got Tassos over here. Say hi. Hey, what's up? And this week, we are excited to be joined by Chase Harrison and Jeff Hansen from Alta Labs. So they graciously took time out of their busy today to talk to us. We're going to talk about Wi-Fi. We're going to talk about their implementations, MDUs, carrier offload, all sorts of really cool stuff. But right before we launch into that, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple or Spotify. Chase, Jeff, again, I uh, really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to talk to you. You know, we um, traditionally focus on things that are primarily just focused on the WISP industry, but there's a lot of overlap with what you guys are doing at Alta, uh, where there it's people doing a lot of MSP work or people using it to uh, MDU stuff. We've seen a lot of that sort of thing lately, especially with the WISP market. There's a lot of people that are looking to sort of get into the service of the MDU markets and things like that as they sort of uh, add different business segments and stuff like that. So I think there's a ton of overlap here. I think this is a good opportunity for uh, our audience to get to know you guys and learn a little bit more about the details past just the, the shiny slicks and stuff like that. So again, really appreciate you taking the time. And if you guys just want to give us a quick intro uh, for each of you, a little bit of history, how you've gotten here to this point. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about Alta, kind of Alta's history and what's going on. So pretty open-ended conversation, and we're just happy to be here with you and learn from you. So I guess we'll we'll uh, go ahead and start with Chase. Go ahead and introduce yourself then, please. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you both, Caleb and Tassos, for having us. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time and allowing us to be a part of your podcast. We hear great things, obviously. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I actually have been in the network land when consulting technology space for almost two decades now. I started back in 2007, um, actually consulting in the WAN land space. We, uh, I was an independent agent for a number of the largest uh, telco carriers in the world. Um, and that really exposed me to doing, you know, a number of uh, kind of very large network deployments with our customers consulting on MPLS, for example, back in the day when I actually still had to pay money for long distance, right? Um, and uh, it allowed me to develop a, a number of really good relationships with MSPs. They were our, our partners, right? We'd go and we'd knock down the big, you know, 500-pound gorilla type accounts together. And um, I left that, got into the installation space where I was uh, sort of an MSP, focusing on uh, more of the residential home automation, high-end luxury homes, doing network design for that. Uh, it, was, it was definitely a fun little stint in my life. Uh, it gave me a, some exposure to different type of clientele in the business, uh, the business folks, right? And then uh, sold that, jumped in uh, on the manufacturing side back in 2013, 14, actually. Um, and again, focusing on that uh, kind of the residential and, and small to medium business space. And uh, now the uh, a couple of years ago, the opportunity to jump in and be a part of Alta Labs uh, presented itself and allowed me to get back to my roots, right? Back in 2007, 2008, um, and absolutely jumped in, uh, uh, both feet, uh, excited to be, you know, back in the, in the business to business space and, uh, working alongside Jeff Hansen and some other, other amazing people on our team to, um, elevate the world of networking. So that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell, uh, Jeff. All right, cool. Thanks Chase. Yeah, I'll yep. get a little bit of background about myself. So I've been programming computers since I was six years old in GW Basic, uh, so been doing computing in general for quite a while. Uh, my first job out of college was uh, actually for card access engineering, so we dealt a lot with Qualcomm chipsets. Uh, we built uh, microphones that uh, go behind submarines. We built car-to-car -car communication, so keeping people safe on the highways. We built uh, we. We took uh, brain sensors and we basically eliminated the, the cable, so built a system where you could do it wirelessly so that people who had uh, cables that were hooked up to their brains, uh, they could actually become mobile. Uh, a lot of really cool projects um, fixed, I, I don't know how many issues uh, with the Qualcomm radio chipsets over the years. Um, and, then, uh, and then I did a six-year stint at Ubiquity, so I was actually the lead firmware uh, in charge of the firmware for Unify APs for a few years. So learned a ton there. And then, yeah, I, I decided to leave and, and then we decided to start this new project out the labs. We just, uh, saw a lot of issues that were still out there in the enterprise networking space. And we, uh, we just really, we saw a huge opportunity 
to clean up a lot of the uh, technical debt that was still out there, right? A lot of uh, poor user interfaces, bad experiences, just bugs in general uh, that makes, you know, people just get used to it. But uh, we, we go in there and we, we break it down and we, we figure out how to actually fix it so that it's uh, user friendly. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of why we're here is just uh, bringing uh, user friendliness uh, and making your IT life easier without the labs. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, ex-Ubiquity people, you know, and a lot of people that our audience knows, Matt Hardy, Tony Rassabong, Ben Moore and stuff like that. So a lot of familiar names, um, you know, and I guess, you know, the first question when, when Alta comes up is like, OK, so, you know, we see this background, you know, we know that Unify is sort of the 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 big 800 pound gorilla in this sort of SMB space right now, right? I mean, but there's also so many other vendors. It's a very sort of busy market, right? Where your ruckus is and all these things and all these options. And then, you know, of course, on the the lower sort of residential side, there's so much, you know, TP Link and uh, Eero and all that. So, you know, the first question I've really got is, you know, what really um, possess you to necessarily take on this insanity, right? <laughs> like, you know, how do you differentiate and go, okay, you know, we've, we've come from this. I mean, obviously the tech side, the experience side, you guys are swimming in that, right? There's absolutely no question about that, but really from a market perspective, and I guess you kind of hit on this a little bit, Jeff is, you know, where do you think you guys can really capitalize on what you've learned, do it better, more nimble, uh, and not also have to like carry a lot of that legacy sort of stuff, I guess. Well, I can, I can talk to you a little bit more on the business decision side, right? Why we decided to get into it. Um, and then Jeff, if you want to take more on the technical side. Yeah. Uh, but a number of years ago, actually, uh, you mentioned the name Caleb Ben Moore. So he, after his uh, exit from Ubiquity, right, he uh, went out and started to invest in a number of different companies. And uh, he actually uh, was already a resident here in our hometown here in St. George, Utah. Um, and he became good friends with our now chairman of the board. Uh, we actually helped him, you know, with, with some product in his house. And he became intim intimately familiar with, right, our executive team and our capabilities and saw some, uh, saw some really cool things from his perspective, right? Uh, you know, not only our culture, but our, our attention to detail, our quality, our reach already globally as far as who, how we're getting to market. And so we, he, that, you know, prompted him to want to park some money with us and actually buy in and become a partner of a company called Sound Vision Technologies as the parent company about the labs. Um, and uh, he, we were focused on just growing our core business, right, with his, with his network of distributors globally. Um, and we just, his transition to Sound Vision, we actually attracted immediately one of his uh, uh, former team members, named, uh, a guy by the name of Dylan Kaufman, who was also um, on the Ubiquity team. And uh, as we grew this network of distribu distributors outside of our, you know, stereotypical channels, um, we we're getting a lot of positive encouragement to say, hey, you know, we're saying, hey, you've got Ben, you've got Dallin. We're see, we've got a lot of issues in in the SMB enterprise space as far as uh, networking equipment's concerned, right? And it wasn't just Ubiquity, it wasn't just TP-Link, wasn't just Aruba. Um, lots of holes everywhere, right? Whether it's the business side, performance, or supply chain. Um, it just seemed like there was a need, right? Kind of a vacuum that um, not only the distribution partners were expressing some disheart towards, um, but also down in the trenches, right? Guys that are actually installing the gear, they're having some frustrations. And so um, Ben and I had, and, and our team uh, quietly went to work seeing if we could find somebody, uh, a product visionary that could help us kind of plug these holes. We had, we had the capital, we had uh, the manufacturing expertise, we have the distribution network and what we were missing was really the technical aspect of that. And if we couldn't have found that, uh, we wouldn't have gotten in Alta Labs. But fortunately, we found our Jeff Hansen, <laughs> Nintendo <laughs> world champion of all things. And uh, anyways, yeah, Jeff, if you want to take it from there and talk a little bit more on the technical side. Sure. Yeah, I'll play you guys in Tetris after this. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Challenge yeah, accepted. Bye. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're like, right, we're done talking about access points for a second. Yeah. So, so I want to play video games. This is boring yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of the things, problems that we saw or that I saw with enterprise networking in general was, uh, you know, the, the roaming protocols, roaming quality. Uh, a lot of times when you do the handoff between access points, it just doesn't work half the time, right? <laughs> and, uh, I think that's still the case, um, but without the labs, we've we've really dug in and gotten deep into the protocols and uh, perfected that uh, communication between the access points, and not just between our access points. Obviously, you get the best experience if you're roaming from an Alta Labs to an Alta Labs uh, access point, 
uh, using fast roaming, um, fast transition protocols. But even uh, you know, if you're using a non Alta Labs access point, we we still will perform better as far as like providing that handoff between uh, access points as you roam throughout your building. Um, so there's that technical uh, challenge that we we believe we've uh, surmounted. There's uh, Alta Pass, which is uh, our patented uh, multi password technology. So with Alta Pass, you're able to have you know a bunch of different passwords. You can use our API to upload a whole bunch of different passwords, assign them, and and it's not just like uh, real simple stuff like assigning VLANs. You can also set like download rate, upload rate. Um, we have a really cool technology where um, you can set up a Wi-Fi schedule. And uh, after the schedule turns off your, your network, right, uh, users that are blocked, it'll still broadcast the beacon, basically, right? So you can still get onto that SSID, but when you get on there, it gives you a splash page that says, hey, this network's currently down. Do you want to request access? And, and you can actually prompt the user and allow them to get them onto the network. So it sends a notification to the administrator saying, hey, do you want to allow this user onto the network right now, even though it's currently you know, supposed to be off. Uh, and it's all real time, right? They, they click one link and suddenly the user gets online and, and it, you know, it, we've tried to make it as user friendly as possible. So when, once you click that and allow that user on, they can get on. Um, and then you can also, with AltaPass, you have the ability to actually like uh, bypass that. So if they, you can have parents' passwords, you can have administrators' passwords, and you, then you can have kids' passwords, right? So Maybe the administrator is allowed on the network. Uh, they can bypass the schedule all the time. They can bypass the hotspot all the time. But then you put in a different password, and uh, they they have to adhere to all the normal uh, you know guest uh, policies and stuff like that. Um, also, that's something that's really cool that's built into our AltaPass technology is uh, all the different network types. So, what I like to call effortless scalability. So it's the ability to you know when you have a simple Wi-Fi network. You can only have a few dozen uh, clients on the network at any given time. E even across like a dozen APs, you, you really can't have that many clients on your network because all of the multicast and the broadcast traffic just builds up very quickly. And so with Alt AltaPass, you actually have the ability to uh, scale very quickly. Uh, so we actually have filters built into every single access point. Wherein if, if you choose a different network type, so there's a standard network type, which is real simple. That's what you get with any, you know, off the shelf AP. Once you get into the large or the guest or the internet only or IOT network types of AltaPass, then you're able to, it, it blocks all of that multicast and broadcast traffic. And it actually has, we have ARP proxy, which is pretty, pretty standard amongst other APs, but we also have an MDNS proxy. So even if you have a, a network with thousands of users, if you set the large network type, you can actually still communicate with other devices, communicate and discover other devices on that large network while keeping the airtime utilization, you know, to an absolute minimum. So it's just um, very easy to scale. So that's that's another major feature of AltaPass that we bring to the market that sets us apart. Um, another couple things is uh, our, our mesh technology. So uh, if you, you know, Obviously, it's recommended to always run a wire to every access point wherever possible. You're going to get the best experience with that, obviously. That, that's a given. But there are going to be special cases where you're just you're not going to be able to get a cable there, right? And so we, we have our Alta Labs mesh technology, which works with our, all of our Alta Labs access points, that allows you to create a mesh that's highly optimized. It still gives you, you know, high speeds and, and you can monitor that link. You still have to be relatively close, but you can monitor that link quality with your mesh in real time. And then the other thing is <clears throat> we have special technology that, that uh, keeps it from forming loops, right? So that, that's one of the biggest problems with mesh is uh, you, you set up a mesh network, you have two or three nodes that are off on their own. And all of a sudden, randomly, it just like your net whole network goes out. And it's like, what just happened? And uh, often it's, uh, it's because of mesh. And, and a, lot of tech, a lot of partners out there, a lot of vendors out there, the first thing that you do is turn off that mesh so that you don't run into these problems. Well, you don't have to do that with Alta Labs because we have extra technology that protects you from forming those loops. So you can still get the advantages of that high-performance mesh, but you don't have to worry about it you know, just totally clobbering your network which often happens. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I I remember my first WDS based uh, <laughs> looped broadcast storm back when I was yeah. a wee lad, and it was definitely one of those uh, painful learning experiences. So yeah, definitely, for sure, for sure. definitely. My yeah, my favorite term is mesh. Let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not near the dirty word that it used to be. It used to be a very dirty it's word. It's still years, pretty years dirty ago. to me, but yeah, yeah. It depends so, uh, on how you use it, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a way to use it properly, and then there's a way to abuse it, just like like anything. But so I'm kind of uh, curious. I mean, obviously. <clears throat> You're doing a lot on the software side of how the users kind of interact, uh, you know, with with uh, your wireless network and how you guys handle a lot of that. But you know, how about on the hardware side? I mean, do you guys see yourself, or is that part of what you want to do? Is is uh, you know, offering kind of like. Uh, very unique hardware as well, like uh, you know, like the Wi-Fi modules that go into wall sockets or look like smoke detectors and other things. I mean, it, it, do you see yourself in that space as well, or is it mainly about the user experience of the software with, you know, so to speak, you know, you know kind of uh, a standardized type of hardware platform to work with? Yeah, good question. I think uh, initially, right, just. Before we could get uh, too creative, we needed to get a, just a basic stack of products, right? Initial product offering that was useful by most companies, right? That would allow us to serve a purpose in the SMB space, um, SMBE, um, and the MDU space. So uh, at launch, right, we've we've launched just uh, now we have three access points, an outdoor, uh, an indoor pro, and a standard model. And then we have a couple of switches. Uh, but, you know, even just with the first products that we've offered, we've, you know, we haven't gone to anywhere in Asia and grabbed something off the shelf. Everything's literally been designed from the ground up, um, including our firmware, right? Uh, and the, the software that runs on our management platforms as well as our hardware. Um, so we, we wanted to, for example, on our APs, <clears throat> have it be really easy to mount and, and, and dismount the access point rather than have to use any sort of special tool. Um, you can do that all by hand, right? We wanted to uh, make your time to install really quick. We're actually about ready to uh, drop a video um, probably this week where we compare our, our style stack rankings against, you know, three or four of the other very large competitors out there. And we, um, you know, try to keep it as, as Switzerland as possible, right? As, as, as even as possible. So we're not trying to uh, adulterate that at all. Uh, but we're a third of the time to install. Uh, knowing that guys that are running, you know, technicians, whether you've got one or hundred, um, for yep. every access point, if you can shave that down by 60%, 70%, I mean, that's that's money yep. in your pocket. Yeah. People, uh, yeah. Yeah, people definitely definitely forget about the user experience and how important that is uh, to any product, you know? Yep, for sure. But we also, on the performance side, right, I mean, we benchmark, you know, just if you take a Wi-Fi 6 access point and put it against our Pro, uh, we're, believe it or not, 20 to 40% stronger than, uh, on range and throughput than... Um, pretty much anyone else out there. And again, take a word for it until you get a chance to get a pro in your hand and, and test it out. But we want to stand out amongst our competition here at launch and into the future for sure. So how do you, <clears throat> how do you benchmark that? I mean, as far as specifically on the range, like how, why are you 40 to 60% uh, more on range? Do you have better antennas? Do you have better receive sensitivity on the radios? I mean, what makes that happen? I'm going to let Jeff take that one. Yeah, so I mean, on, on the antenna design, we were very specific. <laughs> um, I had a, a goal of keeping that, you know, a lot, a lot of antennas have like some hot zones, right? And uh, we tried to keep it more general purpose so that no matter where you are around the AP, you can put it in any ori orientation that you want and you'll, you'll get good performance. Um, because that's the thing, like people, they don't want to always install it a certain way, certain direction, uh, on the ceiling, on the wall, whatever, like people will install it how they want to install it. Um, and uh, obviously there's an ideal scenario, but uh, the, the way that we've designed the antennas, um, you know, it, it's it's lower gain, um, but it's higher gain in all directions, right? So it's it's more omni, so that it, it matters less uh, where or exactly how you install it, but you still get that high performance no matter where it's installed. And I will say, like, this is a new antenna design. When we worked with our, our manufacturer on, on how to design the antenna, uh, it was something new that they hadn't done before. And uh, we, we saw that it fit our form factor perfectly. And so, yeah, it was just like it was like it was meant to be. 
Um, and so that's what we went to market with, with our antenna design. Antenna design, form factor, and, you know, we don't, we haven't gone cheap on things like the front end, right? Our RF front end is, is, is probably one of the more expensive models of that. So combine, combine all that together along with Jeff's incredible uh, firmware. I mean, yeah, yeah. People often process. don't understand that when you look at, let's say, like the reference board designs that are out there that you can find anywhere uh, from any manufacturer. I mean, it usually comes with the cheapest crap you can get just to make it work because it's all about making it work. So that way you can, and then, you know, people don't realize how much time, energy, and engineering goes into actually fine tuning that to make it really crisp, you know, and, and work really well for what you want to do. Yeah, and reading reading past a spreadsheet, and that is so important. And kind of backtracking a little bit. So, in a past life, in the uh, I guess early aughts, if we're going to start referring to things that way, uh, I worked for a company that did a lot of MDU type of installs, campus wide install mm -hmm. stuff like mm -hmm. that. So we would be on site managing many hundreds of access points, many thousands of users, and you know I was doing a lot with the the install techs, turn up management, scalability, so on and so forth. And you know these points that you're making are definitely things that we've run into suboptimal installation especially like mesh units they're like okay we put a mesh repeater in this unit and i'm like okay cool where is it because the signals yeah. are still terrible and they're like oh it's behind the sofa because the resident didn't want to see it right uh one of the reasons why i i tend to opt away from wall plugs type of installs or the you know, we're like, oh, we're just replace the socket feed in the wall because invariably it's either behind the TV, behind the sofa, under something, metal or whatever. file so cabinet. A, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, and I think this point, like people have gotten sort of ceiling blindness. You know, especially in the MDU type of install, there's so many sensors, IoT things, and stuff like that that play into it. But you know, that is a big part. Like you said, turn up install time. You know, using various brands. I mean, there was always so much time wasted on gimmick squash plates for uh drop ceilings right so yeah it looked good but you spent 30 minutes physically installing this thing and you've managed to blow out a bunch of panels in the process while oh, the yeah. new guy learns and stuff like yeah. that right. there's right. you know those sort of things broken clips or like you have to like you've got a, a 0.1 millimeter sort of gap to shoot the hole with with a pin so you can unscrew this thing down and invariably this uh monster that you've got pulling stuff down on a 12 hour day just ends up doing some um questionable things so you know it's that that sort of focus on thing and then focus on scalability, you know, cause we had, you know, back then I think we ran through all the, the common, not mistakes, but I mean, it was 10 plus years ago. Right. So you're like, I'll just get this Meraki and I'll put 50 SSIDs on this. So every unit can have their own SSID, not realizing that we were completely obliterating the airtime. Right. We learned, we learned very quickly, you know, what to do. Uh, we learned very quickly about uh, shared resources on controller and be like, oh, we put 5,000 devices on a controller, which we'll talk about controller stuff here because I know that can be a contentious topic at times. So we'll want to talk about that here later. But, you know, these sort of things, we've gone through the whole gimmick of, you know, every individual unit has their own SSID, which is great until you go and try to get grandma's new iPad she got for Christmas to scroll through the 150 networks she sees so she can find her own unit number. So... You know, there's a lot of these sort of, of pain points and stuff I think I've run into. And a lot of what you're talking about with scalability uh, is really important, especially angling towards like, you know, we've got a lot of, of our WISP customers that are really interested in, you know, getting into the MDU space, right? Because as a local business, technical resources, they come in and be like, I can give you a backup link to your existing Comcast or whatever you've got, you know, but also want to serve the Wi-Fi. The, the community Wi-Fi thing has just gotten to be such a popular amenity being offered, you know, not just outside of hotels where that sort of stuff's common, but really your, your living spaces and stuff. So, you know, when you're thinking about uh how you deploy you're like i'll just buy a bunch of cheap ap's and run the cables back and whatever like physically sure but there's so much from a planning and, and scalability perspective and these are a lot of the problems that you guys are solving and i think it's really important that people do a lot more research and go you know it's, it's way more complex than just doing a simple ssid setup like oh i've put wi-fi up in my home i could do it in a 500 unit apartment complex and it's not exactly how that works at least not past the first day when you realize that managing this thing's an absolute nightmare so yeah it's interesting actually we uh right as we started out the labs we actually got pulled into a project uh, that uh, had been completed with one of our competitors right um and it was surprising to us how many tenants had just been okay not using the wi-fi uh, they were using a hotspot or they had 
gone out to like a Verizon or AT&T and bought a, a hotspot and they throw it up on their window and that was their internet just because, you know, the, the, the poor engineering design deployment right on the, uh, on the access points that were in the project, which is a shame because there were tens of thousands of dollars invested in the infrastructure and that it was just not done correctly. Um, and so, yeah, Caleb, your point, right? I mean, Jeff mentioned AltaPass for us. That has been a huge uh, reason why a lot of customers have started to adopt Alta Labs over others is we, we, we solve a lot of that, those issues, right? Where you're able to just actually deploy a single SSID across an entire campus, right? We've got um, anywhere from, you know, 30, 60, 250 unit complexes that are now using uh, Alta Labs access points. Um, and they are just, a, there's a single SSID for the entire campus, which to your point too, Caleb, things are changing, right? In the MDU space, um, but it's no longer just, hey, I've got an apartment and that's all I, that's the only place I go to. A lot of these new MDUs, there's a swimming pool, there's Amenity a cafe, centers, yeah. there's a community center, right? We did one um, out in Notre Dame. It's actually a case study on our website, but there's a dog wash park, a podcast studio. Um, there's a gym. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, golf courses. And so, you know, you, you can configure a network for that apartment, but what happens when they want to move throughout the community? Um, AltaPass solves that because we allow, you know, not only the VLAN assignment so they can take their subnet with them, but we also allow them to, or the, the, the building owners to um, set rate limits, right? So now they can take that rate limit throughout the entire property and not, you know, destroy the bandwidth in a certain part of the project because somebody forgot to uh, configure the bandwidth uh, limitations. So, um it's uh, MDU space is obviously not going anywhere. Um, and those that have had a chance to use Alta, Alta Labs, um, I've been really thrilled with what they've seen uh, from a security, flexibility, um, time to deployment. And then finally, you know, the ability to manage it all remotely without having to be on site every day. So, yeah, so a lot of revenue building opportunities, but not, o- not only, and, and not only that, if, if it feels like having 70 passwords, hundreds of passwords seems like too much, right? I mean, that, that, that can be a lot of work. There are some revenue building opportunities that you can even do very simply, right? So maybe everybody has a normal password or you have an open network that has a certain low limit, right? R- low rate limit for bandwidth, but then you charge a little bit more, right? And so you only have a few passwords that you have to manage as far as something that builds you a little bit of revenue to actually help pay for the installation and the deployment of that network in the first place. Kind of like in hotels, right? When you check in, you can put your last name and your room number and get that free low bandwidth, or you can pay for the day pass, whatever you want to get uh, uncapped or unlimited speeds and stuff like that. Exactly. It's a right. lot of opportunities there. And we've seen, we've seen, uh, you know, MSPs go about a couple of different ways where since they're managing, that's revenue. They get a, they get a capture realized where they do a rev share with the building owner, um, where it's, you know, 50, 50 split or the building owner is, um, keeping all the revenue, right. They just have their management company, um, change the passwords. So good opportunities for, for incremental revenue that now is paying for the cost of the alpha labs equipment. So. Yeah, it's an exciting time in the MSP space. I mean, it's it's a tough space to live in. This is why I I dabbled in it. Was like, nah, I'm good. This is stressful. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna go sling antennas and various other things. But um, the uh, there's so many tools available now. I think the implementations and stuff for cleaner. You know, I've had those those pain points and stuff. Or like, I remember the first time trying to implement the very first iterations of dynamic VLAN passers, you know, various things with PSKs and stuff that you could try to clutch that up. So the the space is it just like the WIS space, right? The WIS space is is never had as many options as it does now, right? And it's the same thing in the MSP space and the related equipment as well. Is you know, technology improves, but it's not just the raw hardware size; it's the management and scalability things, which is really important. So. Yeah, agreed. Well, and, and two, yeah, we're seeing a lot of WISPs actually jump into the MDU space because they're bringing, you know, last mile service with both fiber and wireless uh, exactly. into the building. And I mean, that's that's revenue now, especially with Alta Labs. It's really easy to deploy. Why not capture that revenue, that that market share and manage the entire the entire project? Especially in these times, any opportunity that you've got to diversify your revenue streams, right? It's, you know, uh, reoccurring revenue. Again, that's always the the golden, the golden ticket, right? So mm-hmm. if you can sort of implement these things into the MDU space or whether it's management fees or rev share or whatever else, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for growth there. And we've talked about this on quite a few uh, other podcasts with other WISP operators and stuff. A lot of interest in that area for sure. Definitely, definitely for sure. And, and I mean, talking about revenue, like how about uh, Hotspot 2.0 and stuff like that, right? I mean, that's something that I'm really interested in learning more about and knowing 
how that works. Uh, you know, I always thought, you know, that, and, and, and I, what I think might still be right, I don't know, but, you know, whenever I turn on, you know, uh, uh, Wi-Fi calling on my phone, right, to me as a user, I think that means when I'm on my Wi-Fi, right, it offloads on that and that's perfectly fine. But if that's turned on, does that mean that anytime I pass by a Wi-Fi hotspot 2.0 access point, am I actually offloading through theirs uh, as well, which is, you know, something that's, you know, a little bit more scary for me that, you know, my data is going over somebody else's uh, hotspot and stuff like that. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit about how that works, the fee structure, if there is one and what happens with that. Yeah, so I mean, that that's something that's also very exciting to us. And, uh, you know, multi-password uh, assigned to a VLAN, giving bandwidth limits is great. But that can also carry into a uh, pass point. We recently got certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, for our access points uh, as pass point certified. So um, I, I think it's a really cool time where you can actually, there there are apps out there right now where you can install an app for Home Depot or, or Starbucks or something. And uh, they'll actually help you install like a, a Passpoint certificate so that you can do uh, use open roaming, obviously on within their stores, uh, you know, because they they actually want you to be able to use Wi-Fi to be able to engage with their app, uh, get marketing alerts and stuff like that. And know, know where obviously they do know where you are and where you're walking around. Um, that's just a, a perk that that's a side effect of being able to, to use the free Wi-Fi. But you can actually take that open roaming and you can um, take that profile and use it other places as well, not not just in those stores. And that's one thing that's really cool about open roaming is the more people that jump on board and, and sign up and, and allow people to use their networks um, are able to uh, to, you know, get Wi-Fi anywhere that they, they are. And um, talking about security. So, I mean, Passpoint is. Um, there's various levels of security. Obviously, WPA2 Enterprise is, is fairly secure. There's, there's even, if you want to go uh, kick it up a notch, you can use WPA3 Enterprise. And, and that allows you to have the, the traffic that is over the air be completely encrypted so that nobody can intercept that. Uh, once it gets to the, the network you know that you're using, um, Home Depot or wherever, whoever's network that you're using, it, it will be uh, unencrypted at that point, but most apps, um, most things that we use today, even Chrome, I mean, they, they kind of force you to use SSL everywhere. Right. And so the, the most important thing is that you make sure that you use apps and websites that have, uh, the little lock and, and they've actually done away with the lock now because it's actually required right over the years. Um, it's actually hard to use a website that, uh, isn't en encrypted in, in some shape or form. Yeah, so they should have the unlock to say this is not normal. And they do, anymore. right? If, yeah, if yeah. it's insecure, you will see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're we're seeing the the Wisp community really start to rally behind the carrier offload that that becomes uh, available via the the additional security that Jeff's talking about with both Passpoint and Hotspot 2.0, um, because there are there are options. I mean, there's a couple different ways to look at it, right? Number one, you're just improving your customer experience, and there's um, very large projects, right? We're dealing with a couple of uh, like ski resorts where they don't really care about the additional revenue options presented to them. They just want their customers to be able to have great service wherever they're at on the, in the complex, right? So that, that's, a, that's a business case, right? Which is still exciting to, uh, to Wisps because now that's a bunch of hardware they can sell. Uh, but there's still other, other type of projects, right? Whether you think, uh, you know, cafes, parks, um, other places where you're having to invest in the infrastructure, right? Where you're having to deploy, get the internet where it needs to be. And that costs money, so you need to see some sort of revenue recapture there. And, uh, you know, the big wireless cellular carriers in the U.S. and now even internationally, um, they're loving this idea of, you know, cutting, uh, you know, WISPs in on a, a portion of that revenue for them, you know, deploying Wi-Fi. Um, and for every gigabyte you offload, you're paid, you know, some some dollar amount. Um, you guys, I know you guys probably know, uh, Keith from Ethelplex. Yep. Uh, he's a big proponent of the offload stuff. And I think he, he tries is. to put that in just about every single project that he, he yeah. is in because it's, I mean, he's already there. Why not try and capture some additional revenue from the big wireless carriers? Um, and there's a couple different ways you can go about it, right? Uh, you can go to, um, somebody like an Xnet, right. That has that built in. There's a crypto component and you can get the cash pretty easy, but they've already got all the relationships set up with all the carriers. 
Um, it's just a matter of m marrying like an XNet with an Elf Labs access point and deploying it in your project. And this, you know, as, as people roam in and outside of those projects or venues or whatever it is, those are dollars back in the, the pockets of the Wisps or the venue owner or both, right? Depending on if there's a rev share. Um, but the, with as much data as tra that traverses the cellular networks, uh, they are anxious to get it off their network the best they can. Sure. Um, and there are, right. They, they, they will openly admit, right. There's some opportunities like MDUs. They figure that those guys should be jumping on their own Wi-Fi anyway. So they don't want that offload traffic. But, um, you know, if you're next to highway or you're next to a park, or if you're into a con spin up a concert venue, uh, where they don't, they can't predict that the network demand on their towers, they love paying um, guys like us, right. The, the opportunity to, or to go in and, and kind of help them take that load off their network. So anyways, definitely look at it. Highly encourage you guys to look at it. If you don't, obviously we're, we're happy to chat with you about it. Um, if you need an independent third party, I don't want to have Keith's phone blow up, but, uh, he's, he's uh, a he'd like that though. He's, he's, he's like all that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did the, the podcast with him a few weeks ago or months. I don't know. A few podcasts ago, we actually did with him. He talked. He seemed very excited about it for sure. So, Big deal. and there's there's a lot more opportunity for implementation. Like I saw a test Matt did where he just you know hung one off the side of his balcony in the middle of Atlanta, and really kind of surprising how much utilization there was of it. Right. So I think it's definitely a path where you know if you're interested in it, definitely check it out. Implementation seems a whole lot more straightforward, and it's not you know it's not the sketchy sort of uh, uh, payment sharing things that we've seen in the past. Right. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, over the years, it's like, Oh, we'll give you crypto tokens. We'll do this, that, and the other. And at some point you're like, I'm a little, a little patchy about this, but carrier offload, like is much more real and I guess legitimate, I guess would be the way to say it now. Absolutely. So, definitely yeah. worth investigating. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good, we see, we see a, a huge potential on it. Um, and even internationally, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of telcos that are coming to us saying, Hey, we, we like what you guys are doing. We need to, we need 30,000 access points because we're going to go drop one in every single one of, you know, whatever it is, 7-Elevens over in Asia. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Happy to, <laughs> happy to steal you 30,000 access points. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. and especially at that local level, it's so much easier to, if you're a business owner that wants to have improved traffic in your area or, you know, you, you run the parks or something, it's way easier to get an integrator or an MSP or a WISP to come in there and sort of enhance those services than waiting on Verizon or AT&T to come in and make it better for sure. So, so. true. So true. Well, and WISPs know how to get the, te the get, to get the service where it needs to be, right? They're already in the space. That's just, you need to get it over to this park, get it over to the park, invest in the infrastructure, and that could turn into a nice little uh, money-making machine for you. Exactly. So reoccurring revenue, again, the golden ticket there. So yeah, For sure. Uh, and I guess pivoting a little bit, uh, I want to talk a little bit about controllers, especially uh, cloud controller versus local controller. It's one of my very favorite arguments to watch people go into. So <laughs> the other C word, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy. It's, like it's not exactly a holy word. Cloud it's very much mesh. like watching guys <laughs> argue about which pickup truck is better, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I got, you recently released your local, uh, controller appliance, which looks pretty slick. So. That's awesome. Uh, um, but yeah, if you guys want to talk about that sort of pros and cons of each implementation or where, where you're seeing the, the, the customer base, uh, really leaning towards now in that space. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we started right off the bat, obviously with our cloud controller managed.alta.inc. Uh, because we saw that as something that uh, probably most most people would get behind, right? I mean, there's a, there's nothing like just throwing up an access point and saying set up, add it, whatever, and you're done, right? Um, and, and the nice thing about it too is like it makes integration between sites. So if you have a hundred different sites, uh, you can very easily you know share the device, move the device around. Um, the really cool thing about our cloud as well as um, with our SSIDs that's very unique to Alta Labs is you can actually share an SSID between multiple sites. So you set up an SSID and say, oh, I want this at all the, you know, the Salt Lake, the Provo, the Ogden locations or whatever cities, you know, you want um, this single SSID broadcast in. And then if you make changes to that, it's automatically sent to all of your different sites. Right, so there's there's nothing, no APIs or anything required to get that synchronized. Um, so there's obviously some really big advantage. We also have the social sign-in with Google and, and Apple sign-in uh, that are part of our cloud offering. But 
you know, there are definitely some people who just want to be in complete control of their network and Ree- they don't want to be beholden <laughs> to any, anything or anyone. No. Right? Uh, and we, I will say, I mean, we, we have 99.99% uptime on our cloud. We, we yeah. work very hard to make sure that it's always up and running. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I feel like we've done a really great job, like as far as keeping it up all the time. Uh, but then, yeah, there's there's always going to be people who want to uh, be in complete control. And so that's why we released the, the software controller a couple months ago. We released uh, our, our hardware product is rolling out right now. And it has pretty much all of the exa- exact same features that our cloud controller has. Um, it also has a very you know beefy CPU, lots of RAM, lots of storage, so that you can take it and, and control, you know, a thousand devices uh, very easily. At least with the hardware controller, you can do more if you uh, use like a Xeon server or something like that, that that has tons and tons of horsepower. So yeah, I mean we we've definitely shifted into the space where uh, we support both a local controller, uh, but we've tried to keep the the feature uh, parity there so that you you can kind of go back and forth uh, between the two, just depending on your uh, use cases. And we realize there are requirements, right? Government requirements, healthcare schools some some people uh they don't have an option to use a a cloud controller in the first place so uh it really opens up a lot of opportunities to us to uh to have uh both options available and and for them to be so similar to each other it makes it very easy just depending on the job that you're doing which one you want to use right so if i if i uh just to verify, so you, you offer a uh, controller appliance that anybody can buy, right? But you mentioned Xenon, so can if somebody has the right uh, type server, they can install software on it and make that their controller as well, so you offer them that on top of the appliance? Yes, that is correct. Awesome. So it's a, it's a software license that you can get and install the nice. same software that's running on the hardware controller. Uh, they have the same versioning and everything. Uh, you can run that e- either way, whether it's uh, you know on your own hardware or mm-hmm. on our hardware. Very cool. It's I mean it's all about options there. I love that. I love seeing that. I'm you know unfortunately I'm I'm old school. I'm an anti cloud guy. Uh, <laughs> Caleb and I often have discussions about uh, a lot of stuff like that. So it's cool to know that you have the hardware controllers as well. I like it. So I, I got to know, Caleb, are you a cloud guy or are you a hardware guy as well? Uh, it depends on what I have to maintain. So <laughs> if I've got a team of box monkeys keeping the boxes running or whatever, I'll keep it local. If, uh, if we're running a real lean setup or whatever, and you know I'm not that guy, so I can build a box, but I, this is not my wheelhouse, right? Yeah. So for me, yeah. being able to sort of outsource that technical aspect and time sync it, I'd figure it out, but... You know, a lot of these outfits are running really lean and it gets to be somewhat tedious where you're having to maintain a a bunch of disparate machines all over or, you know, relying on appliances. There's, I I don't know, I'm not going to call out the specific product, but there were like these uh, metal device uh, in a cloud, like we'll call it a cloud me uh, that I've replaced. Couldn't tell you how many over the years, right? Now they've had some various iterations. It's a lot more stable than it used to be. But, you know, some people are very sort of anti-appliance, especially on separate sites. So, you know, it really is a, a Forge Heavy conversation, and it really depends yeah. on the resources that are available to you and how you want to manage. And, you know, I've come from a place where we probably moved our management stack I mean, three, four times as the business grew, uh, as the availabilities grew, you know, at one point we were running a big AWS spread across everything. And then someone did the math and they're like, do you realize how many thousands of dollars we're spending on AWS instances that, you know, that are still having, it's a monthly cap or uh, OPEX cost. And, you know, then we roll back to local machines. The, the keys didn't really work out. So then we found a bunch of scrap micro server stuff and, We've been through just about everything over the years and, you know, you learn a lot of lessons, but it really comes down to this personal preference and in the end, because you're never going to make anyone happy. And especially in this space, there's a lot of um, strong opinions. So yeah. we'll just call it that, right? Yeah. So, See it. See it. Um, but yeah, it's an important. Yeah, we've, we've tried to build all of our our software and our technologies on the very latest technologies, right? Yeah. Not something that's uh, been designed dozens of years ago or anything like that. Like we, we use the latest versions of the database, the, the node, the, everything is like modern. Right. And so 
that helps you with your your hardware appliance, whether it's your own hardware, our, our hardware appliance or yours. Um, you get the benefits of all those years of, of development and research to uh, have the best product and, and best chance for uh, using it on your own hardware. Yeah, and it just takes time. I mean, just like anything, uh, your reputation will grow as your cloud matures and you keep that 99.999% uptime that you talk about, uh, people become more and more comfortable with it, you know, so. Well, and one thing I, I think it's probably worth mentioning too is we launched obviously cloud first, right? Cloud only. Um, and because from our perspective, right, the business decision was made based on the fact that we see pretty much everyone's life already touches or revolves around the cloud in some way, shape, or form, whether it's iCloud or Google Drive or whatever else. Um, and But it was it was actually quite surprising to us how quickly uh, and, and how much of a pushback we got from communities globally, right? I'm not saying it was 100%, uh, but much stronger, much higher percentage than I think we were we were expecting when we first launched. Um, and be, to be honest, a, a premise on premise controller of any sort was way down the list on the on the priorities, right? List of priorities. And so, based on the pushback, based on a lot of the feedback we got, you know, attending various shows as well as even our online community, uh, that that priority list quickly changed so that we could support those Definitely. that uh, didn't want to have any anything to do with the cloud. So. Yep. We comfortably support, as Jeff said, all three, right? We will we'll develop our cloud features first, um, but we will always try within a week or two or three, right? Depending on what kind of feature it is, we'll get the on-prem and hosted con- or in self-hosted controller um, in parity as quickly as we can. Yeah, and that all that all plays down into the, the trade-offs, right? Everything you do, yeah. there's no one best way to do something because otherwise that would just be the way, so... Yeah. Yeah, I yep. mean, in the end, your hardware appliance can crash as well, and then what, right? So, yep. you know, there's yep. there's always a downside to it. I think it's it, it it just basically comes down to responsibility, right? If the hardware appliance crashes, then it's my fault, and you know, I take the blame. But when your cloud crashes, and you know, you tell me it's going to be up in whenever, or you you don't tell me, you don't communicate. Now I feel I'm stuck in the middle, and I don't yep. know what to say, and and therefore that gets me frustrated, you know. So. Yep. So, I, Caleb, you said Ford or Chevy. I didn't hear a Dodge in there. <laughs> not, not even going to touch it, huh? I'm not going to give that too deep into it. So, it's a cyber truck too now. So, no, yeah, hey, yeah, no, 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 no. no, come on now. Take, take that and put it in your cloud. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> drive it straight up. So, someone from Texas would say. Exactly. I, I mean, he lives right next to Elon's uh, Gigafactory. I thought he'd be your best friend by now, right? Dude, so. no, no. I mean, like, I'm surrounded by Teslas. It's ridiculous in my neighborhood. I mean, like, everybody has one. It's just I don't, I don't understand it. You know. So I mean, I, I, the world is kind of moving into this. And let's not go in that the conversation. But like, people are getting used to like having the same thing, right? I like diversity. I like having options. You know, like. It's nice to have options, cloud, controller, my own hardware. That's beautiful. Options. Yep. yep. Not just like Agreed you're up. stuck with this and everybody has to deal with it. And then, you know, it is what it is. So, Well, and honestly, you know, Tassos, you asked at the beginning, or maybe it was Caleb, but why we got into the networking space, right? Why? The, and that's honestly one of the reasons we did, right? We, we welcome com- com- competition. We feel like yeah. the network industry is already better because we've entered. You've seen a couple of competitors really kind of shape up really quick. Um, and start to innovate faster than they have historically, which is which is what I think the networking space needs. They need the Competition pressure. Competition is fantastic. Everybody needs yep. it. Otherwise, you become complacent. You know. So that's right. Yeah. With without a doubt. Um, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't. I'm not a. You know, hugely up to date on this particular space, right? But I mean, I do see things here and there, and it, it just looks also status quo. You know, and it looks so boring and vanilla. And hopefully, you guys spice it up a little bit. That'd be nice. That'd be nice to see something unique and different come out than the standard crap we've been seeing everywhere. So, yep, that's our goal for sure. That's what we're trying to do. So, thinking along those lines, so you guys have recently got into switches, um, which is pain. Um, <laughs> uh, the Wi-Fi side was always way more fun for me, right? Yeah. The switches, I'm just like, oh, this is so tedious. But so you guys are doing that now. I mean, kind of looking forward, you know, into the future. You know, not like really asking for roadmaps or anything, but in this space, where do you think you're going to see the most opportunity for? 
uh, using your agility and things like that to be able to diversify, diversify yourselves further or hop on opportunities. You know, what are you looking forward to in this space? Whether it be, I don't know, Wi-Fi 7, whether it be, you know, integration in this, you know, some sort of local 60 gig stuff involved. I mean, what are you, what are you guys excited about looking for the future in this space? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just excited about, I mean, and I know it's stupid, but I'm excited about my Wi-Fi just always working. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's the Amen. Thing. Um, but, but going back to the point of like, uh, why we built the radios that we, the way that we did, I mean, we have like a 4k qualm front end, we have Wi-Fi seven features on our i five, six APs. Uh, we're embracing a lot of these new technologies with, with Passpoint. I mean, it's really cool to be in a day where you can install profiles very easily onto a phone. It definitely has not been that way for years and years to install a, a certificate onto a phone. So there's a lot of uh, things that are opening up that are helping uh, Wi-Fi kind of uh, be more prolific than it, than it ever has been. And so, yeah, it's using those technologies. Uh, Passpoint is just one of those technologies that really helps with scalability. You marry that with our, our network types and the ability to basically block any multicast broadcast traffic that's unnecessary, right? And, and then all of a sudden you have this network that can have thousands of devices on it um, that, uh, you know, where things just work. And, and that's our whole goal is, uh, and I don't know how many times I've been told this, but like influencers and, and uh, various people, they, they try out our stuff and they're like, I'm just waiting for when, uh, I have a problem. And, and they, they literally don't, they'll be like months down the line and, uh, they're like, well, everything just worked, pro- no problems. And, and that's a lot more than I can say. I think about a lot of my past experiences, so, um, I mean, that's, that's really one of my goals is just, uh, you don't want to have to think about it, right? It, you want it to just work exactly. all the time and then embrace all these new technologies that help it become more scalable and bring Wi-Fi to more, more people. Very cool. Yeah. I think it's one of the most rage inducing things in the world is when you're, when your Wi-Fi just kind of works, right? Yeah. So yeah. it so was annoying. completely broken. You're so like, all right, I can work on this, but when it just kind of does or patchy or weird mesh implementations or stuff like that, I mean, it is purely rage inducing. So, uh, no, I think what you're saying is, is really a, a great sort of outlook is it just, it's got to work because people got to use it and you just work on ways to continue to do that. So well, we see too. There's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for performance improvements, right? Just raw, you know, performance improvements down to the end device, whether that's throughput, range, or you know, kind of to Jeff's point, right? What we're seeing in the industry is is some early adoption of this idea that you don't want to have to pull out your phone and have to jump on a, a new Wi-Fi network every time and worry about where you're going to get the credentials. We will we we will be at the forefront of that, right? We're going to be uh, so you no matter where you. Uh, are in the in the world right we want you to be able to seamlessly take your credentials and move around and feel good about the security you're getting there um rather than you know joining a sketchy wi-fi network in a in a <laughs> cafe somewhere wondering you know how fast they're pilfering your data uh, and <laughs> there's there's especially with what we're at you know on the on the impetus of ai getting out there being able to grab data fast uh right i mean jeff and i you know whether it's a Ford or a Dodge conversation for you guys, we we talk about what quantum computing has got on the on the horizon for us, right? And and the potential security risk that is, and that may not end up being anything, but that's something that we have to pay attention to because if it happens, it'll probably happen pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and we want to make sure that we're paying attention to that. So, Alpha Labs customers, right, uh, along with our our business partners, our WISP uh, partners that are installing that, can go to market comfortably knowing that they've got somebody with an eye on security. I on performance and I on just overall user experience, just being super smooth. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and then you can always just, if you run out of ideas, just say AI everything. Tag an AI on the end of everything, and then, <laughs> hey, piece of cake, billion-dollar idea right there. I share just put with a, you. Start putting stickers on our boxes. AI. Yeah, AI, yeah just AI out. enabled, AI future, AI, AI, AI. And your, web, your website URL, alta.ai.com or whatever. Yeah, you know? the LinkedIn video I saw recently, there's this Sriracha Mayo Right. Uh, and yeah. they're just pouring it's AI and you just pour it on this. You put it in the right before you put the bread down, you put it down and you put the bread and you put the sriracha sauce, then you put the meat and you know, it's just, just layer AI and everything. And, and in some cases it works marvelously, right? There's yeah. no question, but, uh, it is everywhere. Yeah. 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 
All right, guys. Well, I think uh, we've covered a, a lot of ground here. I think people have a lot better idea about sort of the way you guys operate, which was, you know, a part of this is not just talk about hardware specs and software specs, but really getting to understand sort of the methodology of how you're approaching stuff, which you guys think, you know, this space could be, should be, uh, and will be. So it's been fantastic. If you've got anything you want to kind of sign off on a uh, soapbox on uh, or anything like that you know uh here's your opportunity otherwise we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and our audience yeah well and thank you kilo metastos for your time as well we, we greatly appreciate it uh, we're excited to continue to work together with you guys and yeah as far as soapbox shout out right if anybody's interested in, in giving out the labs a shot we've got some uh some wonderful deals put together with all of our distributors if you're a first time user want to get your hands on some product for a, a really good price um, we know that's money out of your pocket, right? Every time you want to consider changing manufacturers. So we want to try and help shoulder that burden the best we can. Um, I'd say reach out to our sales team, sales at Alta.inc. We'd be happy to, to find a distributor that's close to you that you like working with. Um, we've got coverage globally, right? So anybody who's listening to this, no matter the market, um, we'd be happy to you know, introduce you to the right people and talk to you more about what we're doing behind the scenes, what we've got here in the near future. Um, also come check us out at Wispapalooza uh, in Las Vegas in October. Uh, we'll have some of our brand new products there on display. One that we know a lot of people have been anxious about. If you check out our forums, guys are dying for updates on a couple of new products that will be just right around the corner. So, Jeff, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to. Oh, just uh, the, our goal is to make your IT life easier. Just all the frustrations are things that you've ran into over the years with Wi-Fi. Hopefully you don't see that without the labs, right? I mean, that's that's our whole goal. Very cool. Very cool. Tassos, uh, you want to go ahead and close us out where people looking for us can find us, so on and so forth? Absolutely. You can find us anywhere on social media, especially on the Facebook WISP groups. You can find us on our website, rfelements.com, or our forum, rfelab.com, or just email us, tassos at rfelements.com. All right, everyone. So until we do this again, and I come up with another awkward closing that I haven't figured out after 40 some odd of these, uh, <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon. So bye, everyone. See ya. See bye. you guys.